Grab your Bibles, let's get to the heart of the matter, which is the Word of God. Go to the 10th chapter of Luke, and I'm going to jump down and read at verse 30. The 10th chapter of Luke, and I'll jump down and read at verse 30. Luke, the 10th chapter, I'm going to read at verse 30. In your leisure, I encourage you to read this entire story or parable told by Jesus himself. It really, it, it entails uh, really verses 25 through 37. 25 through 37. However, for our sake and for our purposes today, um, so that your shoes do not expire before I am done reading the text, I'm only going to read verses 30 through 37 on today. I was, I was with one of our victory walkers this week and I just happened to bump into her out and, well, I'll tell you, I was at the nail shop and uh, my daughter sometimes asks if she can go, why you don't ever take me to the nail? Uh-uh, that's my time. I just sit there in that chair and that lady say, uh, you relax? You relax? I'm relaxed. I'm very relaxed. So I love my time with Ann. It's the only woman that my wife will let rub on me. And you better believe she showed up to see what she looked like. <laughs> she just sat right there and said, let me see Ann. Oh, you good. Go ahead. <laughs> That's my girl. We love Ann. <laughs> so uh, I bumped into one of the victory walkers. She says, Pastor, I really don't mean no harm. I don't, you know, I don't want to offend you. This, that's okay, no problem. Just say what you got to say. I'm real direct, so I can take it. You know, she said, when you get home, I just want you to do something for me. Not, I hope it doesn't offend you, but I just, I want you to get some of First Lady shoes, and I want you to wear her heels for about an hour. I said, mm mm. <laughs> but you can get to the point and tell me which point you're trying to make. But that ain't gonna happen like that. I'm gonna have to learn that lesson a different way. She says, well, my friend and I, we were at church and, you know, we were in our heels. We were really cute. And by the time we were walking to the parking lot, I said, you know, this is victory. You can dress comfortable. You better put on your kicks and come on in there and get ready to dance and shout. <laughs> she said, I know, but we were trying to be cute. But when we got done, we were walking to the car like this. So then I... I I was working this week in my office with uh, my head sound engineer. He said, Pastor, you know, I don't mean no harm, you know, but. I said, boy, this is the second time now, you know. He said, well, I don't mean no harm, you know, no, no offense, no, but, but you've been going real long these days. Like, like we running back to the thing to try to extend the time on the, uh, on the live stream. You've been going real long. And, I said, y'all shouldn't have gave me this fancy mic. I'll make it short. Try me now and see. Cut me off if you wanna. Me and the Lord gonna have our way up in here today. <laughs> so all I can tell y'all is pack a lunch and dress comfortable. Go to Luke 10. <laughs> Let's go to verse 30. Let's get to the heart of the matter. It reads as follows. In reply, Jesus said, who said? Jesus. Let me try one more time. Who told the story? Jesus. Who are we talking about now? Jesus. And who will we be talking about all year? Jesus. Period. In reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Pay attention to the, 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 the process of direction. It matters. He was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And there was a priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man he passed by on the other side so too did the Levite come on worshipers when he came to the place and he saw him they passed by on the other side but there was a Samaritan 
a stranger that doesn't even really deal with you Jews. <laughs> a Samaritan. The Jews have no regard and have no dealings with the Samaritan in this particular era. There was a Samaritan as he traveled who came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and he bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine on them. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and he started taking care of him. And on the next day, he took two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper and said, look after him. And if it costs you anything more, don't worry about it. When I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And Jesus asked the question of the person who had questioned him. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man? The one that fell into the hands of the robbers. The expert of the law in Jewish law, professional of the Torah. The expert of the law replied and says, well, clearly the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus turned to him and told him, well, you go and do likewise. You go, victory walkers, and do likewise. People of God, saints of the Most High, believers in Jesus Christ, you go and you do likewise. Pray with me if you would. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for what you've done, what you've said, and what we've seen already. Thank you for illuminating our life with your sunshine. And thank you for transforming our life with your sun. We ask in this moment, God, that you would get the glory out of everything that is seen, said, and done, that you would literally begin the process of transforming us from the inside out, that you would even cause the pain of the process to be so bearable because we can see your glory on the other side of it. Take away and strip away the things that are not and position us with the right mind. Let the mind of Christ now be the mind that we function in. And let us, God, embrace your truth with great zeal, passion, and dedication that we live according to your instruction so that we can do and have and be all that you have promised for our lives. You sent us here. You caused us to tune in. You directed us to grab this message today and hold it in our hearts. And as we do, we realize that this word is you. So help us to always hide you in our heart that we might not sin against you and that you would get the glory in Jesus name come on put a seal on it the devil can't break in Jesus name somebody shout hallelujah and amen you may be seated in the incredible presence of our awesome God this month we are talking about generous Jesus we are looking at the principles, the practices, the, the precepts, the, the promises, the truths, the, the teachings, the trainings of Jesus Christ as it relates to generosity. Uh, I cannot wait until we get to the Easter celebration because I cannot wait to illuminate, illustrate, highlight, to bring to the forefront and, and raise to the surface for us again the generosity of Jesus Christ. We sang a song when I was growing up and said, you can't beat God's giving. No matter how you try, you just can't beat God's giving. And so the generosity of Jesus is something that should be modeled. It is exemplary. It is something that we should ascribe to be. It is something that we should aspire to. It is a place that we should long to be in where our mind and our heart are ever encapsulated in the thoughts of Christ and his thoughts towards us is to prosper us, is to help us, it is not to harm us. It is that we be the head, not the tail, the above, not beneath, the lender, not the borrow. It is that we are uh, victorious in Christ Jesus, that we are wealthy in Christ Jesus, that we have health even as much as we have wealth. It says, my desire, beloved, above all is that you prosper, not only that, but be in good health even as. That means at the same time or just like your soul is prospering. Spiritually healthy, mentally healthy, physically healthy, financially healthy. 
That's one that we don't like to talk about. That's one that we usually mute the pastor and we turn the channel and we do not want to hear about the conviction of the word and the truth of God as it relates to God's desire and his design that we be healthy in every single way. Spiritually, emotionally, financially, physically, relationally, socially, that we be healthy in every single way. And so I want to push even further this whole concept of generous Jesus. Last week I talked to you about the miracle of multiplication. That God, if you put things in his hands, can take what little bit you have and blow your mind. He can change your tax bracket and your generations. <laughs> he can change your address and your attitude. He will reposition your thinking and he'll cause you to live on a level that other people are looking up in you, at you trying to figure out how in the world did you get up there because it just doesn't make sense that you were still able to make sense. Oh, y'all will get it tomorrow. I don't know how you got it. I don't know how you could afford it. I don't know how, because it's the miracle of multiplication. It is the miracle of God being able to take something that is nothing and transform it into the most spectacular something that anybody has ever witnessed. And I don't even know why it's mysterious to us. I don't know why it shocks us. I don't know why it causes us even uh, to be alarmed or surprised in any capacity because if we think about it, he took absolutely nothing and framed the whole world. He stepped out of eternity, subjected himself to time. He took nothing and he made something. He gave us access to everlasting life and all of eternity. He, he literally spoke and things became exactly what he said they would be. So why is it surprising that he could take what little we have, put it in his hands, and he multiply it and the masses benefit from it? Thank God in advance. So this week, I'm going to take it a step further. We talked about the miracle of multiplication, but now I've got to talk about the mannerism of multiplication. Because multiplication looks a specific way. It has a posture. It has a demeanor. Multiplication has a personality. It has characteristics. Multiplication has a, a, a sense of, of existence that is notable. When you see it, you can identify it because the mannerism of multiplication according to the kingdom standard and the lens of Christ looks different than the mannerism that we now mistake and misplace for the mannerism of multiplication. In other words, we are deceived. We are fooled. We are tricked. And many of us, because of it, we've gotten trapped. So my prayer is that God will pull you out with his truth. And the only way that I can even teach you about the content or the context of the sermon, or of the parable that we're dealing with in this sermon in Sermonic Selection, the only way that I can really get you to understand is I've got to go back and help you understand you. And a lot of us, we get cringy right here because we don't really want to deal with us. But the first thing that you're going to have to deal with if you're going to ever see God do all that God desires to do in your life is you're going to have to deal with the man or the woman in the mirror. Tell your neighbor it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. In order to help you understand the generous nature of Jesus, the parable that he illustrated, the generosity of mankind, our ability to be neighborly, our ability to serve others and, and literally to live out the, the mandate or the commandment, the second commandment, which is great, like the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. This is the first commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I can't even get you to that until we break down this system that you're in. The system that we're in is a world or carnal-minded system. The world itself is a composition of many different types of systems. God is a systematic type God. Whenever he created the universe, he did it systematically. On the first day, on the second day, on the third day, on the fourth day, there was a system to it. And the last part of his creation was mankind. 
Uh, you know, I don't know this to be factual. There's no theological premise behind this, but it's just my theory based on my knowledge of people and my pastoral experience over the last 19 years. I can probably conclude that he created all the other things and made all in this and ordered all the other components and, and made all the other things that are in nature, that are in the world, that are in life. He separated the heavens from the earth. He put the seas in, in the, and put the mountains in their positions. I can imagine that he got all of these things ready first because he knew that if he made man first, man would be trying to tell him how to do it. Now that's just my own theoretical, based on my pastoral experience. <laughs> but the world is a composition of systems, political systems, economic systems. We have a legal system, environmental systems, societal systems, systems, your body. Even how God fearfully and wonderfully, masterfully orchestrated and put you together. He put you together with a, as a composition or a compilation of systems. You got a skeletal system, a muscular system. You have a circulatory system, a respiratory system. You got a nervous system. You got an immune system. God created the world in a systematic way. And therefore, he established it in order, with order. And it is the created, or rather, he is the uh, creator or originator of systems. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Lean in, I promise I'm going somewhere. Now the systems of this world are not the systems of our Lord. I gotta make sure I put that out there. Because this, this is where the confusion comes in. This is where the breakdown happens. This is where the discord in our own capacity to walk in the authoritative, abundant life that God promised for us. This is where we lose it. The systems of this world are not the systems of our Lord. Well, why is, it that, why is that the case, Pastor? Because you said God is the original creator of systems. Exactly. But then Satan. Satan has corrupted our hearts against the systems of God. He has given us and handed us a false ideology or false philosophy or false understanding of systems based upon the facade or the lies that he has pitched and positioned for our consumption. Therefore, because of his inability to honor the systems of the Lord, he was evicted from heaven. He says, if you can't follow the system, you're going to have to leave the house. Oh, don't act like y'all ain't no parents in here. <laughs> if you can't honor the system, be in at this time, do these chores, do that, you're going to have to go. We all not going to be able to live here under this same roof. I'm grown, not in this system. You grown in another system, the one that you are in charge of. <laughs> and all the parents said <laughs> and all the children said I can't wait till I get out of here and get on my <laughs> Ooh, until ComEd sends you a bill <laughs> help us Jesus Satan has corrupted the systems of God and we have been, he was evicted from heaven and then watch this, he was sentenced to an eternal lake of fire and torment. But in the interim of his spending his eternity in hell, the problem is that he, has, he was evicted and fell into the earth. Therefore, now he is known and regarded according to God and according to the word of God as the God of this world that we now occupy. Yeah, no, that's, that's shocking because most of us don't ever want to think of Satan as a God at all. But according to the word of God in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, he is the God of this world. If it, depending on which interpretation or which version of the Bible you read, it, it either says he's the God of this world or he is the God of this age. But it indicates that he is the one that has major influence over the ideals, the opinions, the goals, the hopes, and all of the majority of the mindsets of people that makes him the God of influence in this world. 
He influences every part of our lives. If you're not careful, you will become influenced and you will lose your godly position. It is not hard to do. Ask Adam and Eve. He's had thousands of years of practice and you think because you were saved for three years. You have mastered it and you can go wherever you want to go and it doesn't matter what they're doing. You save, sanctify, five, five, five. That's why God says, sitteth not, walketh not, standeth not in the, in the seat of the scornful or the ungodly or the unrighteous. You can't go where everybody goes because you can't withstand the influence of the God of this world because he's the one that is influencing our thoughts our philosophies, our education, watch this, and even our understanding of commerce. Because something inside of you has told you that the way up is the lottery. Oh, Father, thank you. Woo! I love it when the Holy Ghost comes through here. That feeling you felt that was called conviction. Swept through this whole, I see it, it's in your house too. It's called conviction. Now, this is the problem. Because we are confronted today with this system of this world, which is not the system of God. But the influence of Satan is so strong that we have begun to subscribe to the, 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 the fallen nature of our own flesh. Okay, let me help you out. You have a natural inclination to do what is wrong. I didn't realize we were going to have to work this hard. Let me dig deeper. Nobody had to teach a child how to be selfish. You came out of the womb saying, mine. They had to break that mindset and teach you if you don't share, nobody's going to get to play with it. Are you with me? So you have a natural inclination because of the fallen nature of our flesh. We are born into sin. Because of the fallen nature of our flesh, you have a natural inclination towards doing what is wrong. You have to have the Spirit of God inside of you. When you receive Jesus Christ, you have the indwelling of His Spirit. And His Holy Spirit is the only thing that is strong enough to give your flesh capacity to withstand the influence and temptation of the enemy and cause you to walk upright with God. Remember, the Scripture says you are the righteousness of God. Watch this in Christ Jesus. So that's the only way that you're going to be able to withstand the temptation or the influence of a demonic, worldly, carnal system that is meant to counter and pull you away from the system of God. If y'all still with me, say something. Blink three times at least. Okay. We good? Whatever system you're in, trains you. You were born into the world system. You are born again into God's system. But whatever system you are in trains you. And whatever trains you, you trust. It even gets deeper than that. Because whatever you trust, <laughs> you will defend. And you'll defend it even if it's killing you in the process. That is a cycle of an abusive relationship. You have been trained in a toxic environment. That system has trained you and now you trust that system. And you're even defending the things in that system Although everyone around you can see that the toxicity is killing you from the inside out. And we can't pull you out of it because you are defending a system because that system has trained you. This is why we celebrate Jesus. Because he's the curse breaker. He's the mind changer. He's the heart fixer. He's the regulator. 
He is the salvation. He is the deliverance. He is, I'm trying to tell you, that's why we celebrate Jesus. Because let's be real, had it not been for Jesus, where would we still be right now? What would we still be putting up with? What would we still find ourselves in? What would we still be defending? What would we still, where would I be? If it were not for the Lord on my side. 1 John 2 and 16 says, For everything in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So I need you to understand that that's not, there are two distinctive kingdoms at work here. There's the kingdom in the earth, or the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Are you with me? And all of your ideas, beliefs, and methods, and operation, and modal of operation fall under one of these two categories, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness. There is no middle ground. There is no, sometimes I operate with the kingdom of darkness, sometimes I operate in the kingdom of God. No, there is no gray area. There is no middle ground. You are either operating under the kingdom of God or you're operating under the kingdom of darkness. And every kingdom has a king. So the question is, who is your king? And if he is your king, meaning the Lord, then why are you being so rebellious against your king? There are laws in every kingdom. There's the laws of the kingdom for the Bible or for the, the Bible rather is the constitution of the kingdom. So you cannot say that you are kingdom citizen of God and you are not honoring God's constitution. And you won't even listen to your king. Oh, help me, Jesus. Excuse me. Each boy. God desires believers. Watch this. His, his whole premise, his whole, this is, if I had to just stop my sermon right now, uh, uh, Brother Sound Engineer. This will be my culminating thesis and this will be my exit ramp. God's desire for the believers is that we switch systems. So they can that we can get consistent results as a kingdom of God citizen. He wants us to switch systems. The problem is you have been so indoctrinated into the systems of this world that now you cannot even recognize the systems of God. And even if you recognize them, they're so awkward, so unusual, so peculiar, and so strange, they make you so uncomfortable that you won't really commit to them. You want to do it, but uh, you know it's not right because the Holy Spirit has been convicting you and you've been feeling some kind of way, but you just keep easing back into it. Help me, Holy Ghost. So we are impoverished as a people. And I, I don't mean as a black people, as a white people, as, as a Latino. I, I mean as a people, as a human race. We are impoverished by our mindset and our beliefs. What creates the spirit of poverty? What creates scarcity? What creates lack? And I don't even just mean your monetary instrument. I'm talking about a lack of peace a lack of joy, a lack of fulfillment. The reason that you keep squandering wealth is because you don't feel fulfilled, so you go buy things to fill a void. The reason you keep falling into the wrong relationship, the reason you keep going into this toxic cycle, you keep getting a different person with the same issues. You are impoverished in spirit because you're continually trying to replace something that's void on the inside with something that you will never find on the outside. But we've fallen into this, watch this, because of our mindset. We have a mindset that we can straddle. We have a mindset that there's a gray area. We have a mindset that we can half in, half out it, and we can make it still. We have a mindset that if we do what, what makes me feel good, get out your feelings. 
And here's the other side of that. We don't believe God. Okay, you can say what you want to say. Oh, you shout. You, you got a great shout. You get, your, your shout cute. Oh, you get it in. I see you. you. You worship God. You show up. You tune in. But you don't really believe God. He ain't talking to me. He's talking to them. No, I'm talking to you too. Why? How do you say that, Pastor? I don't understand why you would even call me out like that. You don't know me like that. No, I don't. But let me just say God does. And he etched it on my heart. He deposited it into my mind. He redirected my entire sermonic script because he wanted me to help you understand and see that you are caught up in a world system. Even and especially in the area of your increase. I, let me tell you, my frustration is I don't want, if God is such a God of increase and prosperity, he wants our soul prospering and our, our life prospering and he wants us to be the head, not the tail, above, not beneath. Watch this, the lender, not the borrow, that is a commerce exchange. That he wants us to be on the top side of increase. I've come that you might have life and that more of Abundant, abundance of joy, abundance of peace, abundance of, 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 of all of the things that come with the attributes and the qualities and characteristics and the benefits that come with being in God. Abundance. If he wants me to have this so bad, my frustration is why do we struggle with this so much? And he says, I'll show you why, but it's going to be hard work because that's what heart work really is. The world system of increase, of money, of monetary instruments says that wealth is the measure of your success. Yeah, the more you have, the more money is seen as a key to access opportunity, security, and comfort. That's why people hoard and squirrel away everything that they can with no regard to honoring God's system and or to, to being a blessing to somebody else. Materialism. Materialism produces status and success. That's why you got everybody else's family's name on you right now. Because ain't no way you're going to shop at Sam's Club, Costco, Walmart, Target. Well, maybe Target. As a matter of fact, we ain't even going to call it Target no more. We're going to call it. Yeah, yeah. I'm in the house now. I'm in the house. A, a, a self-reliance. Success is often attributed to individual effort and capabilities. Comp competitiveness. We are encouraged to compete with one another as a natural part of the economic growth and personal advancement. Not help each other. Compete. Not show each other where we got it from and how we did it. Because we don't believe that God can still do it to us, still bless us, still favor us, and favor them too. I told you, it's a mindset and a belief system. Immediate gratification, we don't prioritize, we prioritize rather short-term goals over our long-term success. So we want immediate gratification. Give it to me now, I want to feel it now, I need to have it now, I can't wait, can't put it off, can't save for it, can't, so we spend it all. Being of sound mind, he spent it all. But Jesus' system is different. Here's Jesus' system. In Luke 6 and 38, he says, give and it shall be given to you. Anybody shout? You got real quiet right through there. You were waiting on the ball to drop. You were waiting on the hammer to come down. You were waiting on something powerful, profound, and something. No, that's it. That's as powerful as it gets. That's as great as it gets. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. Why do we not shout right there? Let me tell you why. Because we don't believe in his system. Okay, I'll read on. You, you may shout at the conclusion. We typically do. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Oh, we about to turn the chairs over now. And running over. Is there anybody ready for the overflow? Oh, yeah, that's where we shout, right there. Oh, me, 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 God. Do it for me, God. Do it for me. But we don't shout 
at the first two words. <laughs> Give and. Help me, Holy Ghost. For with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. Proverbs 11 and 25, a generous person will prosper. A who? A generous will what? Prosper. Not maybe, not might, not perhaps. A generous person will prosper. A person that wins the lottery from the spirit of mammon will be broke. You put more into that than you did your 401k. Help us, Holy Ghost. A generous person will prosper and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. System of God, Proverbs 14 and 31. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. See, Jesus' system is different. It even sounds different than the world system. And this is exactly what he was trying to teach in the text. The narrative in this story is situated in the Gospel of Luke. And it presents Jesus teaching from a parable in a journey motif as he travels towards Jerusalem. There was a lawyer or what would be known as a lawyer in Jewish culture of that day. He was a, a, a professional in the area of Jewish law. He had mastered Jewish law, would have known the Torah, would have had a, a, a well-oiled understanding of what is lawful and unlawful according to Jewish tradition. And so he approaches Jesus in this moment and he approaches him with a question. See, there is a distinctive difference between asking Jesus a question and questioning Jesus. My parents did not mind if every now and then I ask a question. But I better not ever <laughs> question my parents. In other words, I'm challenging your capacity, I'm challenging your intellect, and I'm challenging your heart. I want to know if you're the real deal, and as a matter of fact, I want to trip you up so that I can disqualify and discredit you. And so he approaches Jesus, first of all, with the wrong spirit. But he messed up and came to the right place. Some of you have come to worship with the wrong spirit. But you have messed around and showed up at the right place. And Jesus is certainly the right person. As a matter of fact, they are still in denial. Encourage some people around you and tell them, you about to be real generous after this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you really believe it, then turn back to him and say, watch me change right before your eyes. Watch me. Watch me. He tests him. He tests Jesus with a question seeking to justify himself and trap Jesus up saying something controversial. Man came down from Jerusalem and he says, listen, I, 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 you know, how will we inherit eternal life? This thing that you have been celebrating and talking about, how will we? In other words, prove your system to me. Let me see if you even know the system of God. It's like you, you gonna ask me to prove me to you. I am the system. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So you want me to give you me in proof of myself. He says, I got you. Jesus never answered directly. He was masterful at turning the table on you. And instead he says, I'm going to answer you, but I'm going to tell you this parable or I'll give you this story. He indirectly then begins to qualify himself in front of the man. He says, that was a, that was a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, from Jerusalem to 
Jericho. And there were some robbers that approached him and they beat him mercilessly. They beat him, stripped him, left him for dead. And then there was a priest, I'm going to combine them for the sake of time, and a Levite. There was both a priest, a man of God, a member of the clergy, an official in the house of God, and a Levite, a leader in worship. A person who had charge of the holy things in the worship experience. There was a priest and a Levite. They came along and they both spotted the man. And both of them, the scripture says, had the same reaction and the same response. They saw the man bloodied, beaten, broken, and left for dead. And they crossed to the other side of the street. The energy that they spent didn't go in the direction of the need. It went away from the need as a matter of convenience and comfort for themselves. Now, the priest and the Levite, this was their reaction, this was their response. I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. I said, you know what? In this era, in this time, in the culture, in the traditions, in the laws of this day, in Jewish law, they would not have been able to touch this bloody person because it would have made them ceremonially unclean. Even when women, when sisters would go through the menstrual period, they could not touch them during that time because then as a priest, as a Levite, as a person who is to attend the temple worship, they would be ceremonially unclean. So my assumption is, well, you know what, maybe they couldn't touch him, couldn't help him, could not lay hands on the, the bloodied individual because it would have made them ceremonially unclean. I said, that's it. That's exactly what I said. I said, that's it. That's why they had to cross to the other side. will not be so hard on them. They would be ceremonially unclean. But the problem is, I read the text even further. And the text specifically says, that they were traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Okay, y'all don't get it. Lean in. <laughs> Jerusalem, up in Jerusalem would have been where worship took place or where the temple was. They were leaving the place of worship and going down to Jericho, which is the place of work. I feel this thing right here. They went from Jerusalem down to Jericho and they still crossed. Worship was over. They were on their way from worship to work. But they didn't assist him. They instead crossed away from him and went to the other side. In other words, they were too busy doing church work and never got to the work of the church. There are so many of us who are so busy doing church work that we never really get to the work of the church. We sing in the choir. We are ushers. We're intercessors, we pray, we preach, we play, and we pass by a need, see the work of the church, and we cross to the other side. Because the system that has trained us, has taught us, me, myself, I didn't have to tell y'all, y'all already knew it. I heard Dr. Terry K. Anderson say, don't, don't, don't be so hard on the brothers. I know it looks really bad. You, you officials of the church, you're, you're the, the men of God, the women of God, the people of God. You're part of the house of worship. You are leaders in worship. You, I know it looks bad. It, it really looks bad. At first glance, you're going to look at them and you're going to say, I can't believe these church folks. 
I can't believe how they would pass by a need and not feel generous enough to meet the need. I don't know why. I, I, I don't get it. But don't, don't, be, don't be so hard on Dr. Terry K. Anderson. I love his preaching. And he says, he, he says, they're not bad. They're just busy. I'm trying to help you all feel a little bit better. Because I know conviction has hit you upside the head by now. You're, you're not bad. You're just too busy. Lord, I, 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 would, I would put in more service and more time at the church, but I got so much going on in my own life. I would serve your people, but, but they'll, be all, they'll be all right. There's a whole lot of other people there. They can help them out. I, I would I would sow to the needy. I would give to the homeless. I would sow my time, my talents into this effort, but, but somebody else will do it. The government will take care of it. They, they, have, they have family that can step in. They, they got somebody. They, they, they're going to be all right. No, no. But, but I would, but I'm just too busy. I, I love it when it gets quiet like this. The priest and the Levite had an opportunity to show forth that what they had worshipped, believed, shouted on, danced on, and praised God in. They had an opportunity to put it in practice, and they missed it. Question I have for you is, will you miss it? Are you so caught up in what you got to do in the system of this world that you're going to miss the assignment of God? His assignment is not that you come to church. That's just a part of the fellowship of building one another up in love. But his assignment is that you take the church to the world. His assignment, let me tell you, Worship starts when you leave this place. What you do when nobody else is with you and watching is where real worship takes place. Worship is not the music. Worship is not the praise team. Worship is not the sanctuary. Worship is not these cushioned seats. Worship is not this building. Worship is not just this atmosphere. This is just a place that we gather so we can be equipped to go out into the world and worship by looking like Jesus. Oh, help me, Jesus. So, so not only, not only did they walk across the street, they, they, were, they were upstaged by somebody who they should never have been upstaged by. There was somebody else who came along right after them. They call him the Good Samaritan. But I want to make sure that I clarify in the text, it does not say Good Samaritan. It just says a certain Samaritan or a Samaritan. And so that means it's generalized so you can feel your name in right there. A certain Samaritan came by, saw the man, and the Bible says he was moved with compassion. You mean to tell me that something on the inside of him who did not just come from worship, who was not a part of the temple sacrifice, who was not even present when they were in the worship atmosphere, but something inside of him moved him to compassion when the saints who just got done shouting never lifted a finger, batted an eye, and moved to the other side. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. The, the Samaritan, thank you, Holy Ghost, the Samaritan's surprise because he was moved and he went to the man. See, watch this. He didn't ask. He, the man was unconscious. He's beaten, left for dead, which means he's not even unaware. So he couldn't ask, what, what is your nationality? What's your race? What's your, are you a Democrat or Republican? Are you from the north or the south? Are you black or are you white? Are you Latino? Are you brown? Are you blue? No, none of that. No, no questions asked, just immediately grabs him, puts him, I wondered why the text said he put him on his own donkey. 
And then I realized it's because some of us won't use our own resources, but we'll gladly go find somebody else's resources to sow into somebody else's need. He put him on his own donkey, bandaged his wounds, watch this, with his own hands. He used all of the resources that were at his own disposal. He didn't wait for somebody else to come through. He didn't look at it as somebody else's responsibility. He wasn't caught up in the demarcations of his nationality. And please be clear, it would be the equivalent. This is how shocking it is. It would be the equivalent of a black or a Latino or black or, or I want to say brown, but a, a black or a Hispanic brother or sister having been beaten half to death. And here comes the people of God. Here comes their tribe, whatever that looks like. They come by and they walk on the other side. But then one of the proud boys, a member of the Ku Klux Klan, one of the white nationalists come through and they say, without question, let me go help him out. That's how off the wall this was for a Jew to assimilate in any capacity with a Samaritan. That's what made Jesus at the well with the woman who was from Samaria. That's what made that such a novelty and even caused the disciples to look at him like, what's wrong with you? We don't associate with them. They look upon each other as distant and different to the extent that they do not assimilate or associate. But this Samaritan had no regard for any of the demarcations or the factors that would have divided him. He said, there's a need, I got a generous heart, I gotta meet the need. This is not the way of, this is not the system of this world. This is a system of God. Cause you, you gotta act like Jesus to be able to think and feel like that. You got to have such a, a, a compassionate heart, which is modeling and emulating the, the compassion of Christ that causes you to do that thing right there. This is the other thing that he had no regard of, and this is the thing I want to make sure I position you, that compassion costs you something. Ain't really compassion if you're compelled or you have a compulsion for what you're going to get out of it. But compassion costs you something. I, I, I pay attention. The sacrificial spending of the stranger. The stranger said, I'm going to put you on my own horse. He went and got a room. Put the man in the room, took care of him for the night. Got up the next day, went to the innkeeper and said, here's some money for his stay. Take care of him. And when I come back, even if it costs, do you know how much compassion it takes for you to hand somebody your credit card for somebody else's care and say, whatever it takes, just put it on my card. However much it's going. He didn't say, whatever it takes up to. Oh, come on, I'm going to get all in your business right now. You're going to have a cutoff. You're going to have a limit. I will give you this much and I ain't giving you no more. I will help you to hear, and then you're going to have to figure it out. No, no. He said, here's my card. Put it on my tab. And when I come back, whatever it costs, whatever it costs, whatever it costs, I got to leave that alone. Because I remember, I remember that I was lost in my sin. And there was a man that came through and saw me. I didn't look like him. I didn't talk like him. I didn't act like him. I didn't think like him. But he picked me up and bandaged my broken pieces. And he went to the cross and said, whatever it costs. Whatever it costs. Put it on my bill. God, thank you for Jesus. Whatever it costs. Sit down, sit down. Jesus paid it all. 
Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. And he loved me enough to wash me white as snow. The other thing that it cost a man was not just his money. It cost him his time. For him to have even known how to bandage somebody up, he had to have some talent. It cost him his time. It cost him his talent. But this is the one that we're going to miss. It cost him his convenience. Some of us, we won't be generous because we don't want to be inconvenienced. That's what generosity looks like. It ain't generous if you can afford it. You know, there's a thin line between obligation and generosity. You do it because you feel obligated that it's the right thing to do. But you don't do it because something on the inside of you is compelled to go above and beyond your obligation and be generous. And this is what generous Jesus did for us. He went above and beyond. Watch, watch this, watch this. Do you think, thank you Lord. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Jesus is the word made flesh. He is God incarnate. So he is God. Do you think, scripture says that he could have called legions of angels and stopped the whole process of the cross. Do you not think that in the beginning he spoke and things became, he created out of his own words. Do you think that he really, do you think that he really had to go through having thorns pressed in his brow? The same one who turned water into wine. Do you think that he had to let them beat his back until blood and sinew was exposed, until blood rushed down his the points on his body? Do you think that he had to allow him, them to spit on him and mock him? Do you really think that he had to carry a cross up a hill to complete the task of salvation? Do you think he had to endure all of that pain and he's God? That he can speak and it is? That he can touch a dead man's casket and a little boy can be raised back to life? That he can stand and open his mouth and cause Lazarus by his name and he comes out in his grave clothes? That he can cause fish to jump in a net until the net? Do you think that he had to endure all that he endured? He could have accomplished his goal just by speaking the word. But he went above and beyond. Because he wanted to illustrate for me and you, this is what generosity looks like. This is what a generous Jesus looks like. This is what it looks like. You think it looks like you did what you were supposed to do. I showed up at church. I gave what I was going to give. I gave my tithe. I'm holy. I showed up and volunteered at this thing. I, I, I did. They, they said they only want like 20 hours for the year. I gave my 20. All right. That's, that's compulsion, that's obligation. That's the wrong attitude and God is looking for your actions. God says, nah, your actions gotta align with the attitude that I require, not grudgingly, not of necessity, not under compulsion, but I want somebody that's cheerful, which translates in the original text and the original language, hilarious. I want somebody who's so hilariously giddy and laughing at the fact that they are getting you see, it's not, it's not about what I have to do, it's what I get to do. I, watch this, I get to do this job. I get to preach to you, I get to unlock his truths. I I get to have him download in me. I get to have him allow the anointing to fall upon my life. That I get to be used by a holy God when I'm an unholy vessel. I get to have his righteousness on my side. I get to show up and lift my hands. I get
get to open my mouth and tell him thank you. I get to dance and to shout. I get to bless his holy. It's not what I have to do. It's what I get to do. The world has taught you that you are doing God a favor. Because the world system says that you don't owe nobody nothing. <laughs> you may not know, oh man, the Bible says, oh no man anything but to love him, a debt of love, debt of gratitude. That's good. But you do owe him. God, I owe you. I owe you to honor you. I owe you to, to use what you've given me. I owe you to take the grace that you place on my life and maximize my potential. I owe you to show other people what you look like in the earth. I owe you to be an example. I owe you to be generous. I owe you that. I owe you. After all you've done, I owe you, God. I owe you. I, I could never repay you for all that you've done for me. If I had 10,000 tongues in this place, it still wouldn't be enough to tell you thank you for everything that you have done for me, for all that you brought me through, all you kept me through, all you brought me out of, all you took me over, all that you have done in my... I could never repay you for what you have done for me. I owe you, God. I owe you. And so the least I can do uh, uh, don't, don't, don't take my word for it. He says this. He says, what you have done for the least of these. Just know that that's what you have done to me. The world has taught you to be selfish. Jesus died to show you what it was to be selfless. And you not understand that when you are generous, there is an impact that it has in multiple directions. First of all, it has an impact on you. When you decide to give your time, your talent, and your treasure generously, when you decide to sow into the lives of other people, when you decide to not just honor God through the acts of service and obedience, but you decide to give God your heart, it changes you. That's what you don't realize is it, it changes you. Watch this. How does it change me? Because it takes me from a world system of thinking and it pushes me over into a kingdom-minded thinking. It changes me from the inside. I give and I feel amazing. I give myself as a pastor and preacher and I serve you and I sow the word of God into your life and I leave I come in feeling one way and I leave feeling amazing I feel better once I give him my heart once I give my service to other people once I'm generous with myself I feel better and it's changing me when you, when you sow a seed into somebody or when you sow a seed even into the kingdom service here at your church, let me help you understand, it changes you. Why? Why do you say that, Pastor? Because it causes you to think like, act like, look like, and be like Christ. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. You look like God. People around you will be asking, What's wrong with you? Why are you? What are you doing all of that for? I don't know. I just feel led. I feel compelled. I just want to sow. I want to be a blessing. I just want to go serve. I want to volunteer. I want to roll up my sleeves. I want to be a part. I want to participate. I don't just want to show up at church and eat, but I want to serve food. Oh. I felt something right there. I don't want to just be ushered. Maybe I want to be an usher. I don't just come in and sit, but I want to serve. I don't want to see, but I want to sing. Whatever that looks like, I promise you it changes you. It also has an impact on the receiver. You start meeting the needs of other people, bringing them joy. It turns their heart towards the person that got to be somebody I need to be connected with. Because if somebody that, that is connected to you would make you be this nice and this generous and this loving and this compassionate towards me, I need to know that person. Well, I'm so glad you asked. His name is? Jesus. Jesus. Let me introduce you to him. 
Because the same God that blessed me, because he says he gives seed to the sower. The only reason I'm able to continue to produce seed is because I don't eat it, I sow it. And the same God that is doing it for me will do the same thing for you. It changes the receiver. I was in Tar Target. I was in Target in Atlanta, right there on Peachtree in Buckhead. I just stopped, headed back home, stopped at Target, and I'm in line. And there's a young couple behind me in line. I mean, they had to be young, like early 20s young. They were young. They looked like babies. And I just, I was, I was moved. I don't even know, I can't even tell you about what. Holy Ghost, that's all I can say. I paid for my stuff. And I said, I, I, was, I went to walk off. I did, I did what we do. I avoided the discomfort. Watch this. I counted my money. Oh, don't front. You, you know, the, the, the spirit of this world will start talking to you. I went, flipped my phone open, hit the Bank of America app. I said, oh. Look back at their basket. Come on here, somebody. I'm just trying to show y'all how this thing works. Look back at the basket. I got two kids in college at the same time. And they 20 something too. I went back, I said, Lee, whatever's in their basket, I'm gonna pay for that too. And so the clerk, the clerk says, Oh wow, really? Okay, oh, wow, okay. I said, she said, Every, I said, whatever's in their basket. Y'all got it? Do y'all have everything you wanted to get? Come on, you know how it is. Oh, y'all gonna act like y'all don't know how it is. Oh, you know how it is. You be like, no, nah, you should have got it before. <laughs> Whatever's in there now. Oh, you paying? I said, did you get everything you needed and everything you wanted to get? They say, yeah, yeah, we, we, we think we did. I said, okay, cool. I'm going to pay for everything in your basket, for everything in their basket on my car. I'm going to pay for their, their stuff. And the guy was like, confused. This young man, I mean, when I say confused, his whole demeanor said, I'm confused. <laughs> he was like, I mean, you, you, you going, I said, I got you. Pay for it. He, he was just, I could see him pacing. He was, he almost wanted to be like, no, I don't want you to pay for it. But I think that, that if he had, that little girl would have choked the life out of her. Because he was like, you, you gonna, she said, Pfft. I acted like I didn't see it, but I saw it out the corner of my eye. She gave him a good chest. She blessed his chest. I said, she's going to be somebody good mama when she get older. She got a mean backhand. He said, you going to... And so he just, he was restless. Like, he was literally, like, uncomfortable and restless. And he was pacing. And he's like, man. And so I paid. And the lady that was the cashier, she says, oh, my God, that is so nice of you. I said, God has been good. That's all. I said, it's the Lord's doing. I don't take any credit for it. God is good. She says, oh my, you're such a blessing. And I was feeling down today. This is the clerk. I was feeling down today. I felt like I wasn't going to be able to come to work today. And I was having a bad, but you have just encouraged me just being, I'm trying to show you. Watch this. I ain't done. The little boy, the young man, the young man said, he said, can I ask you something? We walking out. 
He said, can I? Well, no, we didn't walk out yet because the lady, she says, what church do you go to? I said, look at God. I said, well, a matter of, as a matter of fact, I have a church campus right here called Victory City Atlanta. Oh my God, who is the pastor? I said, me. She said, she said, oh my God, you're the pastor. I said, hold on, I got a QR code for you. Scan this, can you use your phone? She said, yeah, I'm gonna I'm sneak and use it. Scan this right here. And so she scanned it and it pulled up and it said, Pastor Smoke. No, she said, oh! Thank you, Jesus, thank you. Now she told me she was gonna sneak and use her phone. She said, I gotta get a picture. I gotta get a picture. I said, baby, don't lose your job, don't lose your job. I'm walking out. The young man says, can I just ask you something? I said, yeah. What made you do that? What, 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 what? No, I mean, like, I said it was just the Lord. No, I mean, but, but what, I mean, but what, like, what happened and what, what made you? I said, God just put it on my heart. I said, I can't tell you except that it's the spirit of God. I said, when you have a relationship with Jesus, his spirit, God's spirit lives in you and he will direct you. He will guide you. He will instruct you. He will tell you what you need to know. He will take you where you need to go. He will warn you before you go into places and do things that you are not. He will cause conviction to rise up and you will have a warning bell that goes off on the inside that everybody else doesn't hear on the outside. I said, when you have Jesus, he gives you this. He said, man, I just, he said, how do I get that? so glad you asked. I said, let's do it right here, right now. I grabbed both of them and I prayed the prayer of salvation. I decreed and declared some things into their life and I shouted all the way to my car. Yes, he is. God is so faithful. Yes, he is. Sit down, sit down. I'm done. Sit down. You don't know how good it feels to know that as a God, that out of all the fruit on the tree, he reached way down and he plucked me and said, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. If you're faithful over a few things, God says, I'll make you ruler over many things. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall men pour into your life. God is faithful. God is faithful. I'm going to be the head and not the tail. I'm going to be above and not beneath. I'm going to be the lender and not the borrower. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. I will come over. I will get in. It will happen. God's going to take care of every need. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, bless your name, God. Woo. Oh, bless your name. 